binary. Um, it's basically our kind of solution to trying to manage uh, security in the cloud. Before we get started with that, I'm going to talk about myself a little bit. So again, my name is Kevin Glisson. I'm a cloud security engineer at Netflix. Netflix, I have the opportunity to work on all different kinds of security automation. Everything from uh, SSL to our PCI compliance and, and hacking away at the uh, AWS endpoints. I'm um, a lover of all things Python and AngularJS, so if you guys have any cool tips or libraries, I'd love to hear about them. Uh, previously, I've worked at JP Morgan Chase, first as a incident responder, and then as a cyber intel analyst. About Netflix. As many of you know, uh, Netflix is doing quite well. We have a lot of customers these days. Um, and we push a lot of bits downstream to all the different customers. Um, in order to kind of deliver that, that service to people, it takes a lot of um, applications to deliver that service, deliver those features, deliver those recommendations, um, and kind of you know, enjoy it every day. A little about Netflix culture. So Netflix culture is a little different than what you might uh, be used to. Um, when you think about Netflix's culture, we really try to focus on developer enablement. And so what does that mean? Um, we really take it to heart to enable our developers to make decisions and give them the power and the freedoms to do that. What that means is that we give them you know, those permissions. They're able to push code. They're able to make decisions about certain pieces of infrastructure. And that really goes into our idea of what uh, development operations really is. Um, for, what, for those of you who may not be familiar with developer operations or DevOps, um, it's really about an engineering team or an engineer owning their whole application end to end. When you think about traditional kind of um, segmentation in a, in a kind of technology, co uh, kind of technology development life cycle, you can kind of think of a developer writing code. He takes that code, he gives it, hands it off to some build engineers who then build it and package it, who then hands it off to um, you know, deployment engineers to get that code running on instances. And then once that's kind of completed, you would then have a monitoring team or operations team that would make sure that uptime is correctly going, um, that there's no issues, that um, you know, everything is running as, as it should. When, an app, when a developer owns that whole, the whole stream from end to end, we feel that that provides them with the best context. So they know what metrics they should look at to determine whether or not their application's up and healthy. They know, um, you know how best to package their application. And we really focus on enabling that whole life cycle and uh, giving those application developers context so that they can do and iterate and create new features um, as quickly as possible. I want to go just take a moment here and go a little bit into how Netflix kind of takes this to heart, how we automate um, a lot of our processes around this kind of sense of enablement for our developers. So it really starts with, you can think of, um, any, it really starts with a piece of code. Uh, that code's you know, maintained and versioned in something, as a source code like Git. And once that developer feels that you know, this is something I want to test, this is something I want to try out, they'll then um, have Jenkins build that piece of code into a package for them. Um, once that package is kind of created, it can kind of be targeted to a Debian or um, you know, an RPM, depending on what your target OS is. That package is taken and baked. So what do I mean by baking? So every different thing we do, every different deployment we do, creates an image. And the way we create those images is we take base AMI, which is really your OS, and we install your packages and that package's dependencies onto that image. From then on, that image is, never changes. It's kind of uh, an idea of an immutable server. So when you think about making changes, this process will always happen every time. This is for bug fixes, for, for new, new features. Anything that requires changes to the OS system will create a new image. And this way, we can kind of maintain an immutable, service, or immutable server model. That model enables us to ensure that you know, regardless of how many instances we deploy, if it would be hundreds or um, thousands, each of those are the same, and we can have uniformity across those instances. Um, you may be familiar with the kind of idea of using Chef or a Puppet to go and actually patch systems. And we believe that 
you know, that can cause, uh, you know, disparity between your different fleets and, and it makes debugging particularly hard. So you got to think about every time we, we do something new, we create these images that can be easily rolled back to and we know that their state is what we think they are and they're not in some weird state. So once those images are kind of created, we'll use additional tools um, like Asgard to actually go ahead and deploy those to the different regions. So if you're familiar with AWS at all, um, you kind of know that inside of AWS there's these things called auto-scaling groups or ASGs, and each one of the um, instances within the ASGs are kind of created off of this base image. So in this way, we leverage uh, existing systems and tools we've built to create this chain from, to go from all the way to code to running system that's largely hands off from the developer. Once it's configured, this will happen continuously uh, when the developer wants to and the process is very, very repeatable and reliable and allows us to manage um, our systems in a lot of different regions and a lot of different um, environments. So you may be thinking, well, that's, that's nice. Um, what else can you tell me about uh, Netflix's environment that makes it kind of unique? So we're uh, almost 99% in the cloud. Um, we have tens of thousands of, of instances in AWS. Um, an interesting thing, when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, but evening times, our peak times, doubles our instance counts. When you think about going home, you think about um, you know, going, coming home after work and you just want to switch on Netflix, all those people, um, we really, really rely on Amazon's ability to uh, grow with us in our, in our load. Um, and along with those, those different 100 applications I mentioned earlier, we also have dozens of versions of each of those applications. So Netflix believes very strongly in um, doing a lot of uh, tests. So they want to make sure they're, they're constantly innovating, constantly adding new features. And the way they accomplish and measure uh, whether or not those, those tests are successful is doing something called um, an A-B test. So if any of you aren't familiar with an A-B test, it's this notion of you have some code, you have some features that are running, and you want to measure a new feature, a new type of workflow, something that the user interacts with to see if that drives new uh, or more, more watching or, or, or better quality watching or, or more happiness from our customers. So what a developer will do typically is take his, his, take his new feature, deploy it through the, the pipeline that I just kind of went over, and then take a portion of the traffic that the full site is currently receiving and point it at the, 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 the test. And then he'll use some, some metrics to determine whether that, that test is successful. And what this means is that not only do we have hundreds of different applications kind of serving these, these, this um, experience to our customers, but each of those services have different source code running at, at the same time. And all this is kind of goes into why we developed Project Monitoring. So when you think about this environment, you think about all these things happening, you think about all the different versions of code um, and all the dynamicism that is DevOps, right? So you, if you let developers push code anytime, you let them uh, create, create infrastructure, delete infrastructure, you think about what all that dynamicism means and how you kind of get a handle on it. Um, because of the nature um, and the freedom we give our developers, there aren't a lot of good places to inject you know, traditional security checks. There's not a way to be able to say, hey, that you have a new release coming up, let's do a security check to make sure before you push that out live, that everything's okay. So Monterey was really intended to be a part of this whole ecosystem of automation. Do you have a question? Yeah. No, so um, the, there's no, we have a centralized team and we basically handle it for the whole, the whole company. Um, so when you think about how you kind of manage all this, this, this chaos uh, of things coming down, there's different versions, you really need a good way to integrate. You have your automated kind of development and build process, and you also need to kind of think about, okay, well, how do I automate and, and, and develop a, a security process around that? We can't really inject these, these gateways or traditional kind of checkpoints to slow down a developer and, and, and give us an okay. Um, this is a real nice, uh, kind of 10 second summary. It's got a lot of buzzwords in it, but what Monterey really is at, a, at its core is just a framework. And this framework enables us to hook into the different uh, services and pieces of context that we can gather throughout our environment 
to, to, to give our security application engineers as much context as possible. Um, our main goal is with, with Monterey is to make it very, very easy to use. So as we you know, develop new sources of information, we bring on new tools, we want to be able to take those tools and take that pieces of information, put it through a kind of pipeline of, of security um, events, and then you know, continue on with, with, with managing how, to, how you scale that up, how you make sure that those tools, even though they're not written necessarily to be um, you know, handled in, and handle thousands of scans at one time, they can still accomplish that goal uh, within, our, within our environment. Um, it is Python based and it's, it's fairly easy. We've made it very, very, um, we've made a very big point in making it as easy as possible for security engineers who, you know, or security application engineers who are used to pen testing, used to kind of hacking on stuff, to make it as easy as possible for them to write their own scripts uh, and then basically be able to push those scripts out to um, our whole environment. So a basic Monterey overview can really be broken down to four different parts. Uh, the first one we have is um, this, this idea of discovery. Um, when you think about things coming up, you think about developers changing things, you think about um, you know, different um, security groups or permissions being changed at all times. Discovery gives us an, a way to go out and search and, and develop the, what the context of our environment is. So we really want to be able to dynamically go out and look say, well, how many ELBs do we have open at any one time? Um, how many uh, instances are, are open to the, to the internet through the security groups? We want to be able to do that dynamically. And discovery kind of portion of, of Monterey allows us to do that dynamically. Um, and not only do that dynamically, but use sources of information from our other security tools, or security and infrastructure tools to give additional context and allow Monterey to take actions when, when when it needs to. Uh, the second part of it can really be thought of uh, taking that discovery information, and even, and even if it is so dynamic, you still want to be able to track some of that information over time. Um, so if you think about uh, a specific application, you may be able to want to see, OK, well, I, I've scanned this with a particular scanner, um, and I want to make sure I want to see when's the last time I scanned it, maybe for auditing purposes. You want to see how many times have I scanned this in the last month. Um, all these type of things that really you want to be able to track the application through its, its kind of security state. So you always want to be constantly developing that security state and identifying what uh, is it about the application that makes it sensitive. Maybe there's additional things we want to do uh, because it is a sensitive application. The third part um, is really about uh, developing security context. So if you think about discovery trying to derive information from our environment. You can think of scanning as to actually take that information that we derive from our environment and actually applying security tools that we all know and driving uh, security context out of those. So typically that can be tools such as um, you know, Zap, uh, Arachni, or Nmap that allows us to take the information we've, we've kind of discovered about our environment and do some specific security testing on those, uh, those, those things that we do find and then take that information and leverage it into our, our third or our fourth um, kind of overview section here is results. Um, in results, we really take all the information you can kind of think of as a big downstream effect, and we make sure we uh, correlate that information as much as possible um, to give the security engineer as much context as he can. So at this point, when he's looking at the results, he has information about, OK, what, what was the environment looking like at any, any one time? Um, what is this application that I'm looking at? What was its security state uh, at the time of this was, this was scanned? And what does that mean for me as a security engineer uh, about what I'm going to do next? So what action am I going to take? Am I going to kick off um, a manual assessment of that particular application? Because I know uh, it was open to the internet when it shouldn't have been. So I want to see what the, the impact is there. Um, and it really drives uh, what we do as next steps as far as um, focusing the, the limited resources we do have um, and, and improving our, our security state as much as possible. So how do we accomplish this? Um, traditional tools, you think about a zap, you think about that GUI that kind of pops up, you think about uh, what, how a, a traditional assessment might go, and they might pick uh, an application 
um, and work on that for a couple months until and create a report and then a developer would essentially fix whatever bugs they found in that report. Um, but when you think about how often we need to do these, how many times we need to do that, the velocity and the dynamicism of all these developers pushing code in different versions and taking versions down, that's not really uh, possible for us to scale that way. So the way we kind of scale these tasks is to develop this thing called uh, a monklet. And a monklet, essentially at its core, is just, you can think of it kind of like a, um, a soldier, right? Has his orders, accomplishes his orders, tells his commanders whether it succeeded or failed. They don't have any state. They don't have any awareness of where they are as opposed to other monklets or other jobs that, that are maybe executing at the same time. And this allows them to be uh, scaled as much as possible. When you think about uh, you know, your traditional just worker queue relationship here, there's nothing, nothing crazy, nothing um, you know, revolutionary about this. But it allows us to take these tools that were once part of um, you know, this manual assessment process, this kind of very, very singular approach, and, scan them, and, and scale them out to as many different uh, nodes as, as we need. Um, and I'd also like to, like to mention that these monklets are used throughout Monterey. So they're used from everything from gathering discovery information, gathering information about our environment. They're used in scanning, so leveraging third-party tools uh, to get that security state about our environment. They're also used in the result kind of function, right? So maybe we need to do some transform of some data of a report to feed another downstream tool. Monklets are, are involved very part of every part of, uh, of Monterey. So I mentioned a little bit about third-party tools, and I just wanted to kind of uh, reiterate what this provides for us. So we're very, very um, open to, we don't want to have any vendor lock-in, or we don't want to be tied to any particular um, application. We found that you know, there's always new different tools coming up. There's tools that are very good at what they do, and we want to be able to integrate them uh, as easily and as quickly as possible so that we can get that benefit from that, those tools enhancements, right? So. Uh, our ability to very, be very loosely coupled with these vendor tools um, allows us to be tool agnostic, um, leverage the best tools for any given tool set, and use both upstream and downstream tools. I mentioned uh, tools like going out and grabbing discovery data. So if, so if a new tool came along that you know, pulled um, some really, really interesting information from ABS, we could quickly leverage that to get that information into our downstream tools. Um, and, the, and it really accomplishes the security heavy lifting. Monterey was never intended to create its own scan engine. It was never really intended to you know, create security tools in itself. Uh, we really wanted to just take existing things and automate them in, in such a way that we can actually leverage uh, the, 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 and provide value um, to our, our downstream kind of security information guys. So of course, uh, I mentioned third-party tools are very important, but it's also very important to realize that it's very, very easy to write your own kind of your monklet and be able to take that little piece of code, use all the infrastructure that Monterey provides, all that information from upstream tools and discovery method, and leverage that um, in a very simple way, in a very scalable way uh, that we can do. Um, so all, I mentioned a couple different monklets that we've created that are very, very simple, that, that don't do anything special. Um, but they've all been created in response to something we've actually seen um, in, in, in the environment. So, um, you know, there's, there's always type of um, this kind of reactionary thing where it was like, okay, well, we get this vulnerability report. Um, we see that this is an issue. We should, the first thing we always think about is like, okay, well, if this is an issue on this site, chances are it's an issue on other sites, right? So we want to make sure we, we establish um, kind of our baseline of, of where else we could have, be vulnerable to this specific thing. Um, and then in addition to that, we want to be able to uh, continually check for that. So if you think about, we see, it, we see a vulnerability, chances are it's somewhere else, chances are it could come back. And we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And then if it does, we're alerted as quickly as possible so we can go ahead and fix that. Um, the first one here, uh, just a little uh, explanation of what these things do. Response Grabber is very simple, kind of uh, give it a URL, go to server, just check the response of it. Right? So we're looking for um, things in the body, maybe uh, open cores, maybe uh, pads that shouldn't be accessible from the internet. Um, all these things are can be checked very quickly and are things that are very useful for us to give us a, a security state or things we're, we're concerned about. 
Um, but it's not something you would typically find in a, in a big scanner. Or if it does, it, it, can, it would take a lot of uh, resources. Um, this, an ELB endpoints is a um, kind of example of, of a discovery uh, monklet. And this basically just goes out and queries all of our ELBs, but it does so in all of our different accounts. So um, it's very important to us to be very um, flexible when it comes to gathering this information from um, all of our uh, AWS accounts uh, and really get a, a holistic view of um, all of our different environments. And then verb checker is similar to response grabber, except for that it'll actually go out and try different HTTP posts that we're worried about. So it'll go out and, and, and um, try different things on these endpoints that you know, maybe shouldn't be allowed. Maybe we shouldn't be allowing delete on these specific endpoints. And it gives us a very quick um, you know, overview and allows us to check uh, continuously for these, for these particular things that we care about. So that's nice. And I want to go over some real rock solid examples of how we use uh, Monterey to take information about our environment, to leverage that, provide additional security context, and then use that information to direct uh, our team to, to think about what we should be looking at next. So if you guys aren't familiar with uh, some of our open source tools, we have a tool called Asgard. Um, and it basically allows us to manage our, our applications in the cloud. Um, it'll set up uh, auto-scaling rules, it'll set up new ASGs, it'll do deployments for us in an automated fashion. And it's a really good source for us to discover, okay, well, what applications are currently deployed in our infrastructure? Um, all of our applications are deployed with Asgard, and so it's a good source for um, you know, identifying, okay, well, I need, to, I need to worry about these specific applications, um, and, and it's a good starting point. And we also, we also query uh, AWS to get information about those applications. So when you think about, okay, I have an application, I have a security group attached to that application, what does that mean? So is that application accessible from the internet? If so, we should take all those subset of applications that are accessible and go ahead and fingerprint them with an NMAP scan. Determine uh, which ports they're listening on. Are there any new ports that have been exposed inadvertently? Um, and, if, and if there are ports that we, we know and care about, we can go ahead and, and do a deeper dive into the application uh, by using a scanner such as uh, Arachni or Zap or any other web application scanners to get, more, or get additional security information about that um, particular application. And once the scan finishes, uh, we'll then upload results to uh, an open source project called ThreadFix. Um, and ThreadFix really allows us to track uh, and particular assets uh, vulnerabilities over time. So what it allows us to do is determine things like trends. So is this application does it have more vulnerabilities uh, over time? Or are we driving down that vulnerability count? Do we see applications that we, um, or do we see vulnerabilities that used to exist, we fix, do they come back? Um, and this allows us to kind of uh, understand uh, at a very, very uh, high level view, if we see um, you know, more and more regressions or more and more vulnerabilities in applications, maybe we need to address, uh, talk to that development team, do some more education around maybe something more systematic in their development process that we can kind of head off and fix. So that's very important to us. Um, so that's, this is nice. This is something you could do um, on a scheduled basis or daily basis or an hourly basis. But if you think about uh, what I mentioned earlier about all these applications, they're all um, coming up and down. There's all very, very different versions of them. It's really not quick enough. So what we do is, uh, we, we try to be, use the environment, use the chaos that all of our tools provide and all the developers provide, um, and use it to our advantage. Um, we have a tool internally called uh, Kronos. And you kind of think of Kronos like a large uh, bulletin board. Uh, important applications, um, important development or deployment applications will all write messages to this bulletin board that anybody can see. And when we see something like uh, a newly deployed application that uh, Asgard has, has alerted us to the fact, we can go ahead and take an action. So we see something happen, change in our environment, we're aware of it, we can go ahead and take an action for, um, to go ahead and, and do our scan, do our basic endpoint of that, of that application. Um, this is particularly useful when you think about uh, when developers are creating tests, they're creating new versions of their applications, 
they're pointing a, a small subset of uh, traffic to those applications. And we can recognize that. We can go ahead and do a, a security scan. We can identify things before that application receives full load. So say that test was successful, that, that developer decides to okay, go ahead and increase that load to the full bounce. If we can determine something in the testing phase, uh, we can make sure that the large majority of our traffic never sees that vulnerability. Um, and that's really what we're looking for, right? So we're really trying to drive down the response time as low as possible because we don't have those traditional checkpoints. All we have is really the response time that it takes when you see an application comes up and a vulnerability exists, how quickly do we respond to it, right? You can think about this in many ways as you know, what attackers would do, right? So we're kind of trying to do it to ourselves. Um, it's kind of in the same philosophy of you guys have ever heard of, um, the, we, have this or we have this notion of a simian army, right? It basically goes into our environment and messes stuff up. Because we know that uh, in the real world, stuff gets messed up anyway. So we want to be prepared for it. So we want to induce this on ourselves. And Monterey runs really, really in line with that and it allows us to kind of run these actions that somebody else is going to do anyways on our infrastructure before they get a chance to do it. And we can do it faster than them. We can do it, we can get that fixed quicker um, than they can identify it. So after we've identified this, this new application, of course, we're going to upload those re results into Threadvix, do our correlation, and then notify uh, you know, us and, and maybe in the application owner uh, about a, a regression if we do find something, or we find something new. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Monterey's roadmap. Um, Monterey is, is, is very, um, it's, it's fairly full featured. We're using it uh, successfully internally in Netflix. Um, we still have some work to do um, being efficient with our scaling. Um, currently, if you think about a uh, normal web traffic server, you, you have a very, very, um, typically very, very uh, uh, regular kind of trend line as far as traffic goes, right? So you'll think about, so maybe you get your, your website gets more traffic in the evening, uh, that traffic builds and loads and kind of goes in a nice big sine wave. Um, unfortunately for us, uh, all the auto scaling metrics and features are kind of built for that use case. And because every monklet is, is vastly different from each other, you have a, a zap monklet that can run for several hours. You can have uh, a response grabber that's doing something very simple, like going out and fetching requesting and do thousands a second. That logic doesn't allow us to scale as efficiently as we'd like. Um, and so the current idea, the current approach is to take that kind of uh, auto scaling knowledge and build that right into the monklet itself. So it can self-describe what resources it's going to need and allow Monterey to facilitate that resource management for it um, because chances are it knows best what it's going to, how long it's, how long a scan's going to take of it, um, how many it can handle any one time. All these things are really, really uh, available to the, the, the monklet itself. And we're always looking for new workflows and new use cases. Um, I went through a, a couple short examples of how we kind of chain together this, these, these different building blocks or Lego pieces, if you can think about them like that. Um, and we're always looking for new and interesting ways to kind of combine that data, try to find new sources of um, interesting environmental data. So as you know, Amazon introduces new services, introduces new metrics, we're always looking to kind of use that data and leverage it to provide as much context as possible to uh, the downstream security engineer. Um, so we're always working on that, and we're always looking for new tools. Um, we're always looking for new tools that can be integrated into Monkle that's going to provide security state um, that can do a cool correlation or something that just increases the value of all this information that we're collecting. Um, and then, of course, uh, we do plan to open, pro open source it. It's not quite ready yet, but we think that this kind of framework, these kind of building blocks, this kind of approach to being able to react to your environment, react to what's going on uh, with your applications is general enough, and the framework is general enough that it could be useful to just about any organization. You may not need some of the scaling size, or you might not see some of those features, but that idea of being able to dynamically react to um, your environment, use that information, uh, and leverage it is, I think, is we think is, is could be valuable to just about anybody. 
And we love to get people involved uh, with writing cool monklets, writing cool workflows, identifying different things um, that, that are really useful for them. So takeaways. So I want to take a, a, a talk a little bit here and, and say, when you think about uh, traditional kind of security SDLC, it doesn't really apply to dev, dev, DevOps. Um, you have developers with these freedoms to create infrastructure, to uh, remove infrastructure, to make changes to their applications at will. You don't have release windows. Um, and you don't have these traditional checkpoints that you might otherwise have in that kind of traditional uh, life cycle. And because of that, you really need to start thinking differently uh, about how you uh, start to approach um, security in that mind. We're very much more of a consulting service. Uh, we very much will want to you know, kind of educate uh, developers, um, provide a guardrail instead of a roadblock or a gateway. Um, and we really want to work with them to enable them to build secure applications. Um, so it's very much around this idea of uh, you have this very, very automated kind of deployment process. Your security tools really need to uh, scale with that. They really need to be integrated. They really need to be a living part of this uh, beast. If you can think about just another, another organ in this whole machinery um, uh, of, of how, how your, your organization kind of works. And then another key takeaway is um, Current security tools aren't really built with this kind of scale in mind. They're very much focused towards uh, like a pen testing type of workflow where you have assessments, you kind of go through um, your, your manual kind of environment. Um, and they're not really built to uh, kind of accomplish this baseline security sca scale um, with as many applications as we're kind of focus with, focusing with. And I want to make sure that I uh, emphasize that Monterey is not intended to ever replace manual penetration testing. Um, it's really, really trying to provide value and context to our application security testers so they know what's actually been done on this application. They know some, some very baseline uh, security state of the application and, allow, and take that information in context and allows them to focus on individual applications that may be hurting, may be very, very, um, that may be accessible to the web, that may be, um, have a history of vulnerabilities and allow them to focus their energy and, and you really use Monterey as kind of like a force multiplier when it comes to security. Um, and just uh, give them a centralized place for all this kind of context that they can then use to make uh, the ultimate decisions about what they want to focus on. Um, and I also want to kind of take a mention here, it's not on the, on the slides or anything, but we feel very strongly about uh, creating or, or, building, or building tools and supporting tools that help you create a solution. So if you think about um, a lot of, of um, a paid for um, vendor kind of solutions, they're trying to sell you something that, that fits all of your use cases. We found through the development of Monterey and our kind of approach why we took this road is that you're never really going to be able to establish uh, a solution. You're never really going to be able to buy that. There's always going to be customiz customization aspect. We found it very valuable to invest in tooling that helps you create a solution as opposed to buying a solution outright. Um, and Monterey is, has been really built with that kind of idea in mind that we, we want to enable uh, security to be um, as prevalent and as automated as possible and allow it to be as loosely coupled as possible so that as our environment changes, as new tools are created, um, as new techniques are discovered, we can leverage Monterey and not be locked into that kind of life cycle um, kind of deployment things. Let's see. So um, I want to I want to pitch right here. So our team is hiring. So if you think taking these challenges and, and um, some of the things we face with a, a large kind of cloud deployment, you think that's interesting? Feel make sure you get in touch. Um, I want to make sure you check out Netflix Open Source. We've had a number of cool uh, security uh, tools released lately. Um, one called Security Monkey and one called uh, Sketchy, among others, uh, that really kind of show um, what we're trying to do as far as you know, putting these tools out there, enabling people to uh, build security into their kind of um, 
operations or, or just build it into their, their life cycles when you are tackling an environment like Amazon, tackling an environment with, where developers have a lot of freedoms and there's a lot of changes. Um, so make sure you check those out. And um, I think we have some time for questions if we have any. Um, so there is no, uh, the, the question is, uh, so th there's a tool called Security Monkey that we've open sourced, and the question was around how do those integrate together? And they don't at the moment. Um, potentially we can use uh, Security Monkey as just another source of data, right? So Security Monkey, if you guys aren't familiar, uh, basically applies these, these rule sets against our uh, infrastructure to alert on uh, bad things, things like uh, user I, or users that have uh, INAM keys that don't have two-factor uh, authentication, um, security groups that are open to the world, right? So we can take that information and leverage it uh, as a discovery thing and maybe make additional actions from Monterey, right? So if we see uh, security change and security monkey, we can then take that new information about that environmental change and kick off a scan against that, that application, right? Because that, now that's open to the internet. And now that we want to know what our potential exposure is. So we, we haven't done that, but that's a great idea to go ahead and actually leverage that information in Security Monkey uh, to kind of take additional actions uh, about our infrastructure. Yeah. So um, we, uh, of course, we would love to be able to make this as self-serve as possible to make the developers um, kind of uh, use Monterey just as, as they would any other development tool. Um, the current kind of theory is that it's still very, very too mature for that. And when you think about switching from a developer who just needs to write his code to a developer who needs to write his code and then kind of understand the whole deployment process and monitoring, um, giving them additional load to have to be a security expert um, doesn't make sense at the moment. Um, so what our team does is what we handle the, the information output on Monterey, and then we act as a consultancy to the teams themselves to say, hey, uh, we've noticed the vulnerability. This is some steps to remediate. Um, if they have additional questions, of course, they can come to us. Um, and if, there's, um, you know, if we think there's more systematic kind of issues there, we'll go and actually do um, additional testing, additional like, white box testing on that application to help them kind of get through that process. Yes, so um, I may have gone over that a little too close. If you think about that, um, let's see here. So you think about these kind of steps. Each of these steps, the results from one are, are poured into the subsequent model. So you can chain them together uh, and you can kind of establish this whole workflow. Alternatively, there's no reason why uh, you can't have two monklets run at the same time. Um, so if you have you know, five different um, things you want to look for, you can, you can tell them to run at the same time and, and Monterey will handle that, no problem. Um, but it, it is a really important part that you can chain these together. You can use information uh, from, from Kronos or, or from one of their, our discovery services, take that information it's, it's just got and use it to actually um, dynamically kind of figure out what the security state is of, of the application. Any other questions? Yes. So, yeah. So, I think this this is one part of our security process. We don't obviously we have static analysis. We have 
some of those traditional things that, you know, we just don't, the, the, the key part to take away is, we'll, we do do other layers of the onion of security, kind of trying to figure out, okay, well, what are the bugs, what are the security common vulnerabilities in our static code? What we don't do is basically prevent an uh, application uh, from deploying before we, we give it an okay. And this is trying to basically um, increase our response time to such, to, to such uh, expedience that um, that kind of limits, it allows the developer to continue to innovate, to continue to roll out, but it also gives us co uh, coverage that we can find it uh, quicker than the bad guys. Yeah, so uh, if it's something, so because we do this continually and because of we have this immutable service uh, kind of architecture, if we do discover something that critical, there's no reason why we can't reach out to developers and say, hey, roll back to your, your last instance, right? So if we see something come up, we scan it, we say this is really bad, reach out to them directly and redeploy um, you know, through our automated build process within you know, minutes or however long it takes to turn off all those instances or not. Um, is, is that, does that answer your question a little better? Okay. Any others? Yeah. Uh, many, uh, uh, yes. Um, I, I don't know the exact date, but it's a lot. We they're, they're all stored in S3. We tend to keep them around forever until we decide that we don't need them anymore. Um, I don't know. I'd have to ask the engineering tools team how long they're actually kept along. Um, but there there's a significant amount of version. I think they keep at least the last like 20 or so. That's, that's again, anecdotal though, so I don't really know. Um, yeah. Yes, so I wanna kind of reiterate that this is very much uh, kind of a process that we deploy to kind of cover our bases, right? So it's never gonna replace uh, something uh, that, that, you know, an automation tool can't, can't cover. But what it does give us is gives us kind of a baseline um, security state of the application and also gives the um, security engineer who's, who could do the actual manual assessment and find those things, all the context of that application in, in a kind of easier, uh, easier uh, method to digest. So they don't have to go out and actually figure out like, okay, well, uh, you know, what, what the security groups is this application deployed with, what kind of, um, what kind of um, permissions does it have, all that's kind of provided for them, and that gives them kind of a, a speedier kind of um, loading into the, the whole, when they do their actual testing. Yes, it's very much a complementary tool to that. It's um, really trying to drive where we should focus our manual testing. Um, and provide that context to, to the security engineer. So we, it's a very much complementary tool. Yeah. Do you have any frameworks that can scan within the image? Let's say like a heart bleed mm -hmm. type situation, you want to see if there are frameworks in that. Yeah. Does this plug into that somehow? So you, you could definitely do that. Uh, you could definitely just have a monklet and Kronos could alert you that a new package or AMI has been created. Go ahead and kick a, uh, a monkey off to scan that AMI for a particular type of version you're looking for, any type like that. There's no reason the framework is generic, jerk enough to definitely support that that kind of use case. Um, it's really about. Well, so you you can scan base. Uh, you, you, that's, that's one way you could, you could basically launch it in kind of a contained environment and you could actually go and, and, and SSH into it. Um, I believe we've created something, not super familiar, uh, one of my coworkers did it, but we do have something to actually go ahead and check the versions of like a SSL for, for on our base AMIs and ensure that throughout our fleet um, that you know we're not vulnerable, we don't have that vulnerable version of SSL um, uh, in any of our running instances kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, because we are able to kind of create as many of these scans as possible, um, what we what we we, we want to do basically is 
run a lot of different web application scanners. And then use something like ThreadFix that ingests um, reports from all those different applications and see where they, they overlap. Because chances are, if you see uh, two application scanners discover the same thing, the false positive rate on those kinds of drops. And because we're able to do as many of these as possible, it's not a manual process anymore, we can you know, do that um, and provide additional confidence that these are actually uh, vulnerabilities that we need to go ahead and address. Yeah? Uh, it, it's both. Um, so this is, a lot of these bunklets are actually very focused on doing web applications. Um, but there are bunklets uh, in addition that we've written that can go ahead and, and make sure check, you know, post and delete on these, these API services that aren't necessarily going to try and crawl this web application, but they're still going to do some um, testing that we can actually do against an API. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have an automated process way to do that. Um, we could definitely try to look into maybe figuring out a discovery and we'll click to, to tell if something's an API or not. That'd be kind of cool to, to kind of discover. We don't have anything right now to, to discover that in itself. Um, but via inventory, we can kind of um, add additional like out-of-band context that, hey, this isn't a web application. This is an API. And you need to take uh, the appropriate actions. In the same way that the inventory system allows us kind of to uh, make sure we, we whitelist uh, applications that, you know, through discovery may be part of this, this kind of whole system, but we really don't want to scan for maybe their third-party resources or, or something that we're not really uh, permitted to, to scan. Or not. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so you're just thinking, like, from the developer's point of view, how do they feel about fixing a bug that's, that's kind of uh, discovered? I think when you think about all the tools we've, we've kind of done around enablement, I think from a developer point of view, you, you would want to feel really good about the fact that I'm obviously going to try to be secure, but if, if, if something else happens to get through, I know my security team is going to go ahead and have my back kind of thing, right? So it really takes away some of the fear uh, that the developer could have be like, oh, well, I don't want to make these changes because I don't want to potentially expose or do something um, that's going to be bad. Um, and it really gives them a sense of security that say, um, I'm, I'm going to try to do it right first, obviously, but I also know that there's going to be a, a checks and bounds against what I do do, and then they'll come and, they'll come and get me. Oh, because the, the process is so iterative, uh, we, we, don't, we don't really notice, right? So there's no waterfall model. There's no like, okay, well, we have to go back and design this, this crazy component. More often, they're, text, they're testing very, very incremental changes. So if, if they deploy a very incremental change because they're deploying so frequently, the, um, the cost of finding that bug so late in the cycle isn't, isn't that bad so because they're, they're constantly doing uh, iterative kind of um, deployments. Anybody else? No? Cool. Well, uh, thanks, you guys. I hope you enjoyed the talk. If uh, you want some stickers, let me or uh, some of my coworkers know. So we got some sweet stickers. <laughs>